Pastor Goethe. And as we listen to him, brothers and sisters, I implore every one of us that we should pray for him silently, because it's not easy. You know it by now that it's not easy to be a preacher and be constrained by time. And as it does so, let's give him that opportunity to uh, present his uh, message to us. Pastor Goethe, you are welcome this morning. You are obviously two hours behind us, but I know you are fresh as ever. God's messes are new every day. I give over to you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I once more am extremely grateful that God has given us the opportunity to uh, study his word together. Uh, we are continuing our study of God's word. And as you know, the theme of uh, this um, uh, series is grace galore, grace galore. And uh, we have looked at a series of uh, topics so far, and uh, we are focused on the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to uh, 10. And from this passage of scripture, we find some remarkable truth about the grace by which we are saved. Uh, this passage of scripture teaches us that we are saved by grace. We are saved through faith. We are saved uh, as a gift. We are saved not of works. We are saved for God and we are saved unto good works. Some amazing truth there about saving grace, saving grace. And of course, on yesterday, our focus was the principle of saving grace. And we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace, you have been saved. Today, we are continuing our study, and our focal uh, verse is again Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. And as you flip the pages of your Bibles to this passage, let me remind you that I believe in the supremacy of the Bible. I believe that the Bible is not just the sole authority, it is the ultimate authority. I also believe in the sufficiency of the Bible, that this book is sufficient to make us wise unto salvation. And finally, I believe in the summation of, of the Bible. I believe that all scripture comprising the Old and the New Testaments only and the 66 books only is God's inspired word. So having shown to you our affirmations or our belief of the Bible, I ask you now to read with me Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 8. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Uh, this text will be our focal verse, and today our study is titled The Pipeline of Saving Faith. The Pipeline of Saving Faith. The Pipeline of Saving Faith. Let's ask the Lord to lead us as we study his word together. Father, we thank you for the blessing of Bible study. We ask that the Holy Spirit, who inspired your word in its entirety, will illuminate Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and give us insight for living. And as it has pleased you, God, to use a frail, filthy, and feeble vessel as myself, I do not ask for mighty words of human wisdom to move the audience. All I ask now, O oh Lord, is that humanity will diminish and that divinity will dominate as you speak to us pointedly, powerfully, and personally in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Beloved, today our focus is, as I said, Ephesians chapter 2, 
verse number eight. Ephesians chapter two, verse number eight. And we will particularly focus on the line that says through faith. Okay, just those two words will be our focus today. And uh, we will discuss the pipeline of saving faith, the pipeline of saving faith. As we reflect on just those two words, through faith, through faith. Now, let's go into the word of God as we consider the pipeline of saving faith. The text says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, through faith. No, Paul, as I've already mentioned, is the master of the preposition. He masterfully uses, you know, uh, prepositions in his uh, teaching. And now he uses another preposition in this text, and that is through. And that is a very popular preposition in scripture. It occurs over 660 times in the New Testament. And uh, of course, uh, you, 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 you find this to be extremely powerful preposition. In fact, uh, he has it 900, I mean, 291 times out of 666 times in the New Testament. Paul, this is about 42% okay, of uh, the use or usage of that particular preposition. Paul uses it 91 times in Romans alone and 21 times in the book of Ephesians. 21 times Paul uses that preposition in the book of Ephesians. Can you imagine that? So what is the meaning of the preposition through, which is dear? What's the meaning of this? It has two mean clearly defined meanings or roles. When that particular preposition is used with the accusative, which is the direct object of a transitive verb, it has no local sense, but it's most commonly reason. You can translate that as reason, which merges at times into purpose. So you would translate as because of or because. Now, when that preposition is used with the genitive, which is the possessive case, uh, it actually plays the role of uh, the path, okay, the path, or uh, in the local sense, you will say through, uh, in the corresponding non-local extended sense, you will say agency or means or manner. And that would signify the route uh, through which something is accomplished. Uh, it answers the question, how? The path to success, for instance. Uh, you see, this is a, a preposition which serves as a marker by which something is accomplished. You can call it the preposition of means. So what is Paul doing here in our text? When he says we are saved by grace through faith. What's the meaning of through faith? You see, Paul is describing the instrumentality of our faith. And the idea is by means of faith. We're saved by grace, by means of faith. So faith is the channel or the pipeline or the path through which salvation flows to sinners. It is the means. Now hear me, whereas grace is the objective cause or objective basis of salvation, through faith is the subjective means by which one is saved. That is very important for the salvation that was purchased by Christ's death is universal in its provision. But hear me, it is not universal in its application. What that means is
Uh, thank you so much. So faith, as I said, is um, a very, very important in our experience, you know, of salvation. I see grace, you know, as the source and faith is the means and salvation is the result. To say it another way, you might say that grace is the reservoir, faith is the channel or the pipeline, and salvation is the stream that washes my sin away. Faith is like a pipeline. You are standing, you know, at one end and the things for which you are believing stand at the opposite end. So the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith, through faith. Now, the text uses, you know, uh, uh, the word faith, you know, yeah, very interesting. And saving faith is not the same as uh, self-confidence, you know, or that comes from pop psychology, you know, uh, proponents, no. Uh, as popularized by, you know, Norman Vincent Peale, no, okay, in the power of positive thinking, no. Faith simply means, you know, uh, implicit trust in God, absolute reliance on God, complete dependence on God, okay? So again, as I said, Uh, Nikelo, can you just get someone to pray for us for the challenges that we're experiencing now? Yeah. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are encountering a technical problem on the side of the preacher as we speak, and we definitely need to pray for this one. We, I, I want to ask Pastor Rapitin if he is here. I think he will do well to assist us and uh, offer a word of prayer here. If Pastor Rapid is here, I didn't see his name actually. Um, He's on the platform. Yes, uh, let's unmute Pastor Rapid to offer prayer for us, please. <clears throat> All right, thank you, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the message. It has arrived in the hearts and minds of your children gathered here this morning. However, we are looking forward to, to have more at this time as we are encountering uh, this um, disconnection. Our pastor is infused by this power about faith why should we be lacking this privilege to listen and hear more? We thank you, Father, that this gadget shall be touched in a special way and the connection come back. Okay. So that at the end, we may be benefiting from what you have in store for us. We lift this gadget in your hand. Bless us now and bless the preacher in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so, uh, uh, yes, so uh, we are looking at faith as the pipeline of salvation. Faith as the pipeline of salvation. And uh, we've already seen the meaning of through and also the meaning of faith. Now, what I'm going to do in the remaining time we have to share will be to look at a few things regarding faith. First, we'll look at the origin of saving faith. Uh, next, we'll look at the object of saving faith. And third, we'll look at the organization 
of saving faith. Those are the uh, three things. And then we'll zoom in on the outcome of saving faith as we wrap up this uh, uh, message. So we're looking at faith through faith. What is faith? First of all, we want to know the origin. Where does faith originate? Friends, I want you to know that our faith is to be on or is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So faith is given by Jesus. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says that uh, Simon Peter, a born servant and the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained, that word means received, like precious faith. Okay, like precious faith. So how do we get faith? What is the origin of faith by which we are saved? I like what Martin Luther says. He says, no man can give himself faith. No man can give himself faith. Friends, so faith comes from the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift. Very important, as a gift. Now, let's look at the object. Having seen the origin of saving faith, what is the object of saving faith? On whom should our faith, you know, be uh, based uh, or anchored? Now, who is the object of our faith? The Bible says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, have faith in God. So we have to have faith in God. The Bible also says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, Paul says, I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God. So we are to have faith in God, God the Father. We are to have faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, and saying that time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. In other words, have faith in the gospel of God. So let's go now to the organization of saving faith. What are the constituent you know, uh, components of uh, saving faith? You see, friends, there are three aspects of saving faith that we need to know aspects of saving faith and those three aspects of saving faith are number one okay number one you have the content the aspect of content all right now this is very important because there are certain things we are required to believe about christ what are we to believe about Christ? What is the content of the gospel that we are to believe? Uh, we are to believe the facts of the gospel. For instance, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose the third day for our justification. Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus is interceding for us. Jesus will return uh, to, 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 you know, ultimately consummate our redemption and destroy evil. Friends, this is the content aspect of faith. In other words, we have to believe the facts of the gospel. Using faith as an acronym, F stands for facts. What are the facts that you believe? What are the facts that I am to believe? So the facts of saving faith are the you know, tenets of our faith, the, 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 the facts of the gospel, the, the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God, all right? So the next thing is consent. So the first aspect of saving faith is content, all right? The next aspect is consent. Consent is actually agreeing that the content is correct. Consent is the believer's agreement that the content is correct. So you've heard that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus rose the third day. Jesus is interceding in heaven and so on. And you agree uh, with this. So that leads to the second letter in faith, which is agreement agreement 
you agree that the content is correct. You believe that the content is correct. But there is also an R in there, which is internalization. You agree and you internalize, okay, what you have agreed about. There is this inner desire that a believer has to, act, to accept and to apply the truth of the gospel to his own life. Okay, now, so we have uh, the content you have to believe, the consent to what you have actually heard uh, through the word of God. And then the last aspect of saving faith is, is commitment. It is commitment. And this aspect then goes to the next uh, two letters of faith, which means trust. That means you trust what you believe. You trust what you have heard. You trust what you have agreed to. You trust what you have internalized. That means you, 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 you confide uh, in the trustworthiness of God. All of your hopes and aspirations. You commit your whole being, you know, to God. And then finally, you have hope. So in short, you will say that faith constitute first the facts of the gospel and then agreement that those facts are correct and then internalization of those facts and then uh, trust in God and hope uh, in God. So the three aspects of saving faith are the content of the gospel, consent to the gospel and commitment, you know, to the God of the gospel. And commitment and faith are always, you know, to be understood uh, similarly. The, 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 the word for believe of, of faith, uh, if, you, if you will, okay, and the word for commitment in, in the language of the New Testament are similar. Okay, the word commit is the very same word believe. So the ultimate expression of genuine faith, okay, is to commit oneself to the Lord. So hear me, saving faith is not head knowledge, not just a mental conviction and intellectual assent. No, saving faith is believing in Jesus, believing who and what he is, that he is the savior and he is the Lord of our lives. Saving faith is commitment. It is the commitment of a man's total being and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here is a perfect illustration of saving faith. Okay, Charles Swindle explains general faith, you know, this way. Okay, and he talks about Anne Stewart, a resident of Portland, Oregon. Uh, she was asked to, to, to cost out, you know, with high wire artist Philippe Petit uh, at the opening of the Portland Center for the Performing Arts. And intrigued by the opportunity, she responded, I would like to uh, meet this man and see if I trust him. Now, her stage will be on a 80 foot wire between the new theater building and the, you know, Allen uh, 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 Sneezer uh, sneeze Concert Hall. Now, on August 31st, 1987, the 91 pound Seward placed her life in the hands of the high wire artist and was was carried on his back while he performed her above the street. Friends, she said that her performance had a lesson for those who witnessed when she was asked later on why she trusted him and got on his back to uh, go on that high wire. This is what she said. I think that one of the most beautiful things about the performance was that it took a lot of trust, absolute trust to do that. She continued, I think in the world that a very profound issue, yeah, is it, I am putting my life 
in someone's else's, you know, hands and trusting the whole crowd not to do anything to distract him. Now, here is the point, my friend, the lesson of this, getting on this man's back that she had believed is very simple. Faith is not just head knowledge. Faith is not just saying, okay, God is good. Oh, God is faithful. God will take care of me. No, your belief must not merely be intellectual. No, it must be featured by absolute trust, total commitment. And this is exactly what Anne Stewart exhibited. She expressed her belief by placing her very life in the hands of the artist. This is a kind of belief referred to in the words of Paul. We are saved by faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus, Paul says, and you will be saved. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. This belief is not merely head knowledge, as I said. It is the response of a heart to the person of Jesus, saying, I trust your redeeming work to deliver me from sin and carry me safely to heaven. That is true faith, my friend. That is true faith. Listen to what Martin Luther says as we wrap up this message this morning. He says, a quiet faith has as the end or use of Christ's passion mere speculation. True faith has as the end and use of Christ's passion, life and salvation. True faith with arms outstretched joyfully embraces the Son of God, giving for it and says, he is my beloved and I am his. That is true, uh, true faith. And uh, listening to this, uh, you know, profound, you know, statement, there are thousands who believe in the gospel and in Jesus Christ as the world's redeemer, but they are not saved by that faith. This is only an ascent of their judgment to that which is a fact. A faith that accomplishes its work for the receiver, a faith in the atoning sacrifice, a faith that works by love and purifies the soul, the moment true faith in the merits of the costly atoning sacrifice is exercised, claiming Christ as a personal savior, that moment the sinner is justified before God because he is pardoned. Well, friends, very quickly, we look at the outcome of saving faith. If you have this faith in God, which has the three aspects or elements of true faith, genuine faith, which are, number one, content, the real truth of God's word, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the content, then your consent to the content that it is true. And then finally, your commitment to that truth, which is exemplified in, in uh, hope in God and faith in God and, and you know, trust in God. This would be the result if you have this kind of faith right now in God. This would be the result. Number one, justification. If you have faith in God, you will be justified. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, therefore, having been justified by faith, if you will have this kind of faith in God, you will be justified, justified. The next benefit or outcome of saving faith is reconciliation, which is peace of God through substitution and propitiation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We are justified by faith. Friends, the next benefit or outcome of saving faith is sanctification. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 2, uh, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Access, which is, you know, the sanctifying presence of God. Access to the very presence of God. And ultimately, the ultimate result or outcome of saving faith is glorification. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse number 2, it says we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hope of the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, this is true faith. This is true belief. 
This is what God expects us to have and experience the great power of God. Friends, this great reformer, Martin Luther, in the 16th century, Martin Luther, he called justification by faith, hear me, the article upon which the church stands or fall. The article upon which the church stands or fall. Justification by faith. If you have faith in God, you will be justified. Friends, let me close with these statements from Ellen White. I know our time is fast spent today but if we have true faith in god this is what ellen white says she tells us about this faith justification by faith she says through all the ages the great truth of justification by faith has stood as a mighty beacon to guide repentant sinners into the way of life she says in review and herod september 3 1889, you know, obviously, this is a critical time. It was just after 1888 General Conference session, all right? And, and, and you know, justification by faith was the argument of that session. And yes, what Ellen White had to say. She says, the present message, the present message, this message we're hearing from, you know, Jones and Wagner, the present message, she says, justification by faith is a message from God. It bears the divine credentials for its fruit is unto holiness. Its fruit is unto holiness. Ellen White continued, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It's presented justification through faith in a show day, okay? It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many have lost sight of Jesus. Friends, I can go on and on. Ellen White has said some amazing things about justification by faith. But let me just close with this statement. When she was asked whether there is any connection between justification by faith and the third angel's message, what is the connection between the message that Adventists have been called to preach? The three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 11 and the gospel of justification by faith. This is what Ellen White had to say in Review and Herod, April 1st, 1890. Ellen White says, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. Yes, justification by faith is indeed the third angel's message in verity. This is what we are called as a church to preach, that people can be saved through faith, through spirit-inspired faith, through Jesus giving faith, through God giving faith. Now, my friend, I urge you today, to have faith in God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it's been rocky today. Connectivity issues and electricity issues. But you, you've had your way today. And you have spoken to our hearts. We have heard a welcome voice that bade us come to you. And thank you for faith, which is a gift. And thank you, Father, for grace, which is a gift. And glorify you, Father, that you have given us grace in abundance. And that you have inspired faith in our hearts to respond to the grace of God. May this be the experience of millions more. For we ask this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Amen, Pastor.